Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Wright, also known as the Wax Whisperer. I hope you're all keeping well and safe. Um, I recently did a talk for the International Symposium of Audiological Medicine 2021 on earwax ceremony management, and I've been asked if I could upload the presentation. So here you go. Hello, everyone. The next session here, distinguished presenting is Mr. Neil Ramakrishnan. He is the director, consultant audiologist, XPPC registered hearing aid audiologist, and clinical ear care specialist. He is a UK pioneer and world leading endoscopic ear wax removal suction specialist. He is also director of his own private audiological practice called the Hear Clinic. In addition, he is the co-founder of ClearWax, which provides international training for ear professionals to safely and competently perform endoscopic ear wax removal, including endoscopic ear suction. Now, we would like to request Mr. Neil Raithata to address the audience with his pool of knowledge. Hi, thanks, Pragnia, and uh, warm welcome to the UK. I just want to start off by thanking Lausa, who contacted me a few weeks ago to see whether I'll give this talk. Uh, it's a very great honour and I'm very privileged to do so. I think my next slide, actually, I think Pragna's actually already addressed that. I'm just trying to go to the next slide, Pragna, but it's not allowing me to switch to my next slide. Uh, you can just... Uh... Um, I normally use my cursors. Uh, okay, you can just minimize your presentation. Oh, and again, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, Pragnus just explained uh, a bit more, a bit about me. And obviously the first slide I wanted to share with you is my declaration of any conflict of interest. And as Pragna outlined, I'm a director of my own private audiological practice in the UK called the Hear Clinic. And I'm also the co-founder and director of a company called Clearwax. Um, Clearwax are the developers and manufacturers and distributors of the wireless endoscope called the iClearscope, which we've specifically designed and manufactured for endoscopic de-waxing. Um, also, under the umbrella of Clearwax, we provide international training in endoscopic ear care. As I mentioned, we manufacture and distribute the iClearscope worldwide. And we also sell to um, specialists in the UK, uh, the whole range of ENT micro instrumentation used for endoscopic and also microscopic earwax removal. And we also have a, a, a national website in the UK, a web portal for members of the public to access to find their local specialists. So I just wanted to um, outline all my conflict of interest prior to giving the presentation. So before we can talk about earwax, we need to have a brief overview and recap of the ear canal. And I appreciate you're all audiologists, so I don't want to teach you guys how to suck eggs, but let's just have a brief overview of the ear canal anatomy. So the outer ear canal is medically known as the external auditory meatus. The average length can obviously vary between genders. Um, male, uh, males have slightly longer ear canal lengths and um, Children obviously have shorter um, ear canal lengths, but on average in adults, we're looking at approximately around 26 millimeters. The average ear canal diameter is also variable, and it's not only variable again between gender and age, but also within a specific individual as you enter the ear canal and go from the lateral to the medial aspect, there is variations. Um, but on average, we're looking around seven or eight millimeters. And the ear canal itself is, is oval shaped with the height being greater than the width. Um, in the adult ear, we all have an inclination of the ear canal. So there's an upward slope, uh, approximately 32 degrees. For children, for pediatrics, that could be uh, the inverse. It could be a downward slope in their infant ears. Um, the ear canal itself also is slightly acidic. Um, there's a uh, the average pH range is between 5.4 and 7.1, and the acidity in the ear canal, um, it's there for a reason. It tries to inhibit certain bacterial and fungal growth. So, um, and also when we talk about earwax a bit later on, earwax is also slightly acidic. And everyone's ear canal has a natural resonance frequency. So if the longer the ear canal, the lower 
the natural resonant frequency is. So obviously, conversely, vice versa, the shorter the ear canal length, uh, the, the higher frequency is the natural resonance. And if you've got a wider diameter, the greater diameter of your ear canal, the amplitude of that natural resonance is greater. And conversely, if your ear canal diameter is narrower, um, your amplitude of the resonance is reduced. You can think about the ear canal in thirds. Um, the outer third of the ear canal is made up of cartilage and a thicker layer of skin, uh, approximately one millimeter in thickness, and there's some muscle underneath that skin. And on the cartilage portion of the ear canal, you find hair follicles and sebaceous and serumous glands, which actually attach to the hair follicles. The cartilage portion of the ear canal is flexible and elastic. So when we're performing a toscopy, we can retract the pinna posteriorly and superior to straighten the ear canal. Um, the cartilage portion is semi-sensitive. You can apply some pressure to it. And importantly for this talk, the cartilage portion of the ear canal is the site of earwax secretion. We'll come on to that a bit more in the next few slides. The inner two thirds of the ear canal is exclusively a very thin layer of skin, uh, almost one tenth of the thickness of the skin that lines the outer cartilage portion of the ear canal. Um, and it's uh, directly attached to bone, it's really tightly attached to the bone. So this, the inner two thirds of the ear canal is rigid, it's non-flexible, and it's very, very sensitive. Um, and our ear canals are S-shaped. We have uh, a first bend. Uh, the first bend is approximately, I uh, would say, half a centimeter into the ear canal. And the second bend is where um, the bony part and the cartilage portion of the ear canal meet, so the osseocartilinous junction. And we also have two narrowings in the ear canal, um, and we call the narrowing um, an isthmus. The first narrowing is um, about a centimetre into the ear canal, and again, it's at that osseocartilinous junction. And the second narrowing is approximately five millimetres away from the tympanic membrane. So let's go to the next slide. So this is a, a I've got a, another schematic, a side view of an ear impression I took, and this ear impression extends all the way to the tympanic membrane, and I think it provides a good illustration of the anatomy of the ear canal, the upwards trajectory, the curvature, the narrowings and openings. Um, and you can see um, at the entrance of the ear canal, um, the mean average height is 10 millimetres, whereas the width is 7 millimetres. And then that narrows um, where the first isthmus is, so the osseocartilinous junction. And then after that first isthmus, the ear canal again uh, widens. And then the second isthmus, which is half a centimetre away from the tympanic membrane, again, once again, narrows before it widens again, where it makes contact with the eardrum. So the eardrum is perpendicular to the floor of the to, ear, to the ear canal, and that um, creates a recess as an anterior and an inferior recess. Um, so, what is earwax? Um, earwax is medically known as cerumen, and it's a, a perfectly natural, healthy um, substance um, that's secreted by the outer cartilage portion of the ear canal, and it's uh, typically a brown and yellow in appearance. However, as it oxidizes, if it's been in the ear for a long time, that shade of brown can get darker and darker, and in some cases it can almost turn black. And earwax has a natural pH of approximately 6.1, so again, it's slightly acidic. Earwax is composed of three different compounds. The first one is dead skin, so dead keratin that um, sheds from the ear canal. It, that is also mixed in with oily sweat. Um, so this oily sweat is secreted by ceremonious glands, um, also known as modified apocrine glands. These ceremonious glands are almost exclusively found in the ear canal and also the armpit and in the genitalia regions of, um, of people. It's different to the normal sweat we have from the eucrine glands. And um, they are the glands that we find on our palms, on our forehead, on the rest of our body. And um, eucrine glands secrete watery, salty sweat, um, where ceremonious glands actually secrete um, an oily uh, sweat. It's a bit thicker and viscous than your normal sweat. And 
also found in earwax is a substance uh, secretion called sebum, and that's secreted by the sebaceous glands. And these glands are found all around the body, and they're normally attached to hair follicles, so you'll find them on your scalp as well. And sebum is an oily, lipid, waxy um, substance made up of uh, a range of different organic compounds, such as alcohols, long-saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, chains, cholesterols, and squalenes. So all of these three compounds, dead keratin, um, oily sweat, and sebum, as they mix and amalgamate, that's what creates earwax. So just some interesting facts about um, the different glands. So some immunous glands, although we're born with them, they 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 only become active um, during puberty, around that age. And they are stimulated during the fight and flight um, um, reaction. So when you're stressed or you're uh, in physical pain or you're frightened, also um, apparently they get stimulated um, during sexual arousal. And they are genetically determined. Um, whether you have ceremonial glands or not depends on a single genetic mutation, which we'll cover in the next slide. Um, Sebaceous glands, if you look at the, the compounds that make up um, sebum, um, alcohols, fatty acid change, cholesterol, squalene, so it could be argued that also is diet dependent. So there are two different distinct types of earwax and they are genetically determined by a single gene mutation to the ABCC11 gene. So the two types of earwax is wet and dry. And on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see um, images of both. On the top right, you've got some wet earwax and on the bottom right, you've got some dry earwax. So if you have wet earwax, that means that you've got one dominant guanine um, allele that is found on the ABCC11 gene. And this mutation, so having this guanine um, allele um makes you have ceremonious glands and these ceremonious glands as i said they're exclusively found in the ear canal um, and in your armpits and um as they also um, secrete an oily sweat they also release a chemical that bacteria feed on and um which then causes a, a release of a, a really foul odor so in other words guys if you've got um if you do have um, body odor in your armpit area, that means you've got wet earwax, you've got that gene, okay? And wet earwax generally has a higher concentration of lipids and fatty acids um, from the ceremonial glands, because it is an oily secretion, in excess of 50%, and um, obviously less dead keratin. And wet earwax is more common in African and European races. Um, Conversely, dry earwax, if you have dry earwax, you don't have that dominant brainy, um, allele. You have instead um, homozygous recessive adenine allele. So you've got two recessive adenine alleles from your, you've inherited that from your, that recessive adenine allele nuclear base from your uh, mother and father. Um, and without that guanine allele, you don't have the ceremonial glands. So your earwax is dry. Dry earwax has a lower lipid fat concentration, so you're looking um, around 20% or less. And it is more common in East Asians and Native Americans. Also, older people gen generally have dry earwax, and that's because they have reduced cell hydration. As we age, um, the epidermis and also dermis skin cells, they become thinner and flatter, and they become less, um, they, the ability to retain moisture is significantly reduced. So um, if you've got um, some moisture in the earwax in, in the elderly people, uh, these cells um, do the osmotic effect. They absorb moisture from earwax into the cells, which causes the drying of the earwax. So the mechanisms and functions of earwax. So earwax is, as I mentioned earlier, is exclusively secreted on the outer cartilaginous portion of the ear canal and it sits on the epidermis skin layer that lines the ear canal. The human ear is very clever indeed. It's evolved over millennia to, um, as the skin sheds in the ear canal, it naturally migrates outwards and sideways, um, a bit like a snake skin, uh, in a conveil belt motion towards the ear canal entrance. If it didn't, um, if you've got a dead skin in your ear canal and as it shed, it just fell into your ear canal, 
everyone's ears will be continuously blocked with dead skin and we'll be very busy as audiologists uh, charging people to remove that. So the human ear has evolved to self-cleanse itself. So as the skin sheds, it naturally migrates um, laterally sideways out of the ear canal in a conveil belt motion. And we call that the epithelial migration. So it's these epithelial um, skin cells. So these epithelial skin cells are the ones that um, are on the surface. And below that, you've got the dermis layer. And the epithelial migration rate is I would say a minimum 1.5 millimeters a month. So that's 0.05 millimeters a day, if I'm correct. And uh, it can be compared um, to the same um, growth rate of your the keratin of your fingernails. And as this skin, as this conveil belt motion of the skin, as it's shedding, uh, that process also expels earwax in the, in the, in the, at the same time. So what is the reason? Why do we have earwax? So there's four main reasons. Um, so earwax um, is believed to be a, a mechanism to help the ear self cleanse itself. So because earwax is quite soft and sticky, any foreign particles that enter the ear get trapped by the earwax. And as the earwax naturally migrates out of the ear as, as, um, as, uh, because of the epithelial skill migration, it too expels all the foreign bodies and particles it's trapped, uh, which have entered the ear canal. Also, earwax is, as I said, a slightly lipid, waxy substance, and um, it provides some lubrication, some protection to the skin that lines the delicate, um, the delicate layer of skin that lines the ear canal. Um, also, um, it's believed that earwax also has some antimicrobial effects. With it being acidic, it inhibits certain bacterial and fungal reproduction. Um, and also, it's also believed earwax is an evolutionary byproduct um, to help repel insects. The acidity of earwax um, stops ear, um, insects, group of crawlies that are ancestors who, who must have slept on the floors uh, in caves many, many thousands of years ago. Um, so, yeah, it, it may also have an ancient evolutionary uh, uh, reason, benefit, and advantage. Next one. So, for well, the majority of people, this is and this is just UK data, but I, I don't believe they, there's any reason why this data uh, is different culturally uh, and demographically around the world. But for the majority of people who are in the UK, it's estimated around 94 to 98% earwax naturally migrates out of the ear and it doesn't cause a problem for the individual. However, that still means up to 4 million people in the UK alone suffer from earwax impaction, we call it earwax impaction ceremoniosis. And there's many reasons why people suffer from ceremoniosis. And some of those reasons are that the epithelial migration of skin, skin cells are either reduced or the individual loses the ability to, um, to naturally shed the skin naturally out of the ear. And it's known that if you've undergone radiotherapy, that skill um, epithelial migration is stopped. Also, if you've got dry skin, so for elderly people, as I mentioned earlier, um, the dry skin causes friction and it um, halts or stops the epithelial skin um, cells migration. And also, if you graze your ear canal, so think about the, these skin cells as a train track. And if, you, if you're using a cotton bud in your ear, you're grazing this epithelial layer of skins, you've, you've actually damaged that train track. So the skin can no longer migrate. So that's some of the reasons uh, whereby if you're, uh, some of the causes um, for the loss of skin migration. If you have a narrow or twisty ear, so patients who suffer from Down syndrome are known to have very narrow ear canals, or if you suffer from stenosis, which is a, a narrowing of the ear canal, more medially, generally speaking, the bony portion due to chronic ear infection or swimmer's ears, or if you suffer from exostosis, so surface ear where um, the bony part of the ear canal um, swells, you normally get three prominent swellings um, in response to exposure to cold water or cold wind, generally speaking. Um, so if you have a narrow, twisty ear, the wax just gets trapped, um, the skin cell doesn't migrate, it gets trapped um, in the narrowings. Um, if you have widenings or erosions of the ear canal, so of course, if you have mastoid cavities or benign osteotitis or canal cholesteatomas, these cr create um, trenches, uh, caves, um, 
cravats within the ear canal and the skin can no longer migrate. It gets trapped in these erosions and widenings and caves of the ear canal. And when they get trapped, they, obviously earwax um, cannot also migrate out of the ear alongside the skin migration. And some people simply have hyperactive sebaceous and ceremonious glands. The ear secretes these substances far quicker than the ear can actually expel it from the ear. Um, if you've got hairy ears, um, so uh, I've written older men because it's just an anecdotal thing that I found with my clients. Um, older men tend to generally have more hair, still ears that grow in their nose and ears. Um, all the parts where we don't want it to grow um, and where we do want it to grow at the back of our head and our scalp, we don't. So, and these hairs um, mat the earwax, um, so it creates a matting effect, it traps it, it's like a forest, and it doesn't allow wax to, or dead skin to migrate outwards. And if you've got very, very dry or very, very sticky earwax, they just stick to the ear canal walls and they just simply don't migrate outwards because of friction. And of course, um, probably one of the biggest reasons for earwax infection is self-inflicted by patients themselves through use of cotton birds and also ear candling because that's just further impacting um, and dressing the wax more immediately, so further towards the eardrum. And for patients who wear hearing aids or earbuds, um, of course, that stops the natural migration uh, of earwax. And it can also, uh, in the same way as cotton buds, further impact the wax deeper into the ear canal. So there, there's some of the reasons why we suffer from earwax infection. Symptoms of earwax, now, um, you, you all can sure know this, um, but although earwax is a benign condition, it can cause the whole range of otological symptoms, ranging from hearing loss, oral fullness and pressure in the ear, uh, or some people describe it as a sensation of water inside the ear. So very similar to eustachian tube dysfunction, otalgia, so ear pain, tinnitus, that could be both pulsatile or non pulsatile People with impacted earwax can also suffer from vertigo or disequilibrium. I generally find that's the case where they've got unilateral earwax, um, also than bilateral earwax, if they have vertigo or disequilibrium, because that can affect the the vestibular system that creates a mismatch between the two ears. Um, autophony, so uh, you've got impacted earwax, similar to occlusion, which is the next one, it traps internal respiratory sounds um, and your own voice inside your head. Um, excessive earwax can also cause headaches, it can cause a lot of pressure in your head and your ears. Also, excessive earwax can stimulate um, uh, and elicit the gag reflex due to stimulation of the Arnold's nerve. So the Arnold's nerve is a nerve at the base of the ear canal, um, which is wrapped around the temporal bone. And if that is excessive uh, impaction and pressure, it can stimulate that Arnold's nerve, eliciting a cough reflex. We all know that through taking ear impressions. Um, quite often we get ear impressions and we put REM tubes in people's ears, people do cough. And obviously, as audiologists, we're fully aware that earwax can cause acoustic feedback, so whistling or hearing aid. Um, sound, amplified sound is uh, reflected back out of the ear due to the earwax, re-enters the hearing aid microphone, re-amplified re into the ear, we get that feedback loop. So how do we diagnose earwax? And the reason for this slide, I did a presentation for uh, a group of doctors in the UK during the pandemic, and a lot of doctors were trying to diagnose and differentiate uh, blocked causes of blocked ears remotely over the phone for their patients. And I was trying to explain to them that because earwax can cause every single otological symptom, it's virtually neon impossible to 100% for sure, diagnose a patient with earwax over the phone. You, you simply have to examine the external auditory meatus. Unless you've also, I've got obviously loads of clients who are chronic sufferers of earwax. So if they do call me during the pandemic, I can be pretty sure. Um, um, sorry, I just got a message there about my audio. I hope my audio is okay. I'm not going too fast for anyone. I'll just carry on and if I get another message, um, if I'm speaking too fast, guys, do let me know. Um, so the only way to really know if someone's got earwax is to get your otoscope, or microscope or endoscope out of, um, out of your drawer or your medical kit bag and look inside the ear. You can't do that remotely. Um, the only other way I can be pretty sure someone calls me um, to book an appointment that I'm pretty sure they've got earwax is if they report their hearing aid to, uh, is whistling and there's no other reason. So they're confident they're fully inserted the hearing aid and the hearing aid is 
clean. Uh, there's no wax in the wax or the dome. Um, you can be pretty rest assured that, you know, that it's, it's earwax causing that feedback. So treatments of earwax. Um, there's many different types of treatments of earwax. Um, probably the one of the most accessible types for the patient is earwax drops over the counter. However, I would contest that this is a, a standalone treatment for earwax. Instead, I believe earwax drops is um, more useful and beneficial prior to having your earwax removed professionally um, as it can help soften the earwax. Also, earwax drops can be used as a preventative measure. And once the patient's had their earwax cleaned, if you use earwax drops on a regular basis, it can, you're almost using them as a rinsing agent because, of course, water should be avoided at all costs in the ear canal. And if you regularly instill some form of earwax drops into your ear um, in a way to rinse your ear of wax before it significantly builds up, I think that's where um, earwax drops has its major role, as opposed to once you've got a substantial amount of earwax, earwax drops are not going to uh, cut the mustard, they're not going to remove that wax. And in fact, uh, it can also exacerbate your symptoms. Um, if you've got a substantial amount of earwax, the earwax will absorb the drops, expand and swell and create more of a blockage and exacerbate uh, the patient's symptoms. There's generally two types of um, earwax drops, oil-based and water-based. Um, the oil-based drops are generally um, more acidic in pH, whereas the water-based drops um, are generally more alkaline, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, contraindications to earwax drops. So if you have a tympanic perforation or mastoid cavity, uh, it's uh, advised to avoid earwax drops. I've put grommet there with an asterisk. So again, a grommet can allow access for the earwax drops to enter the middle ear, which we don't really want, but we want to avoid. But I know if you've got a blocked grommet, ENT uh, generally recommend to, to use sodium bicarbonate earwax drops because it's perceived to be less phototoxic um, than possibly olive oil um, and oil-based drops. Also, um, we all have some sodium bicarbonate in our bloodstream, so it's, it's more than natural um, human um, substance compared to um, some sort of oil. Of course, if you have some sort of allergy to the drops, whether, so in terms of oil-based drops, some, there is some peanut oil earwax drops. If you've got a peanut allergy, of course, you want to avoid that. Or if you've previously used a certain type of drops and developed an allergy, of course, try to avoid those drops again in the future. And if you have otitis externa, so inflammation infection of the outer ear canal, it's recommended you do not use earwax drops. Um, some of the bottlenecks of using earwax drops is for your hearing aid wearers. Um, if you've got uh, a patient who wears hearing aids, the earwax drops can interfere with the hearing aid, it can block the sound bore, the drops can enter the, the, the electronic parts of the hearing aid and cause um, reliability electronic faults. Um, the next point there, I've, I've put a box around it because it's a very important thing, I believe. Um, it's how you use the earwax drops. Um, I've read the instructions of the majority of earwax drops manufacturers, and I don't really think they're very good, if I'm honest. Most people, when they use earwax drops, what they do, they put um, the drops in their ear, um, and they put some cotton wool, and they let it soak overnight. Um, that's probably the worst thing you can do, because all you're doing is actually causing, so if you're filling up your ear with earwax drops, uh, and leaving it, resting it in your ear all night, the drops is softening the earwax and the earwax is just getting softer and softer and it's drizzling further needily towards the eardrum and then it will get impacted on the eardrum. And also if you put cotton wool in your ear where after you're putting the earwax drops in, it, the cotton wool is just going to absorb the drops so the drops is not going to penetrate the earwax. So the way I recommend uh, my patients who use earwax drops is I ask them to instill the drops for five minutes and um, so the ear that you're putting the ear wax drops into which be facing the ceiling. So the ear, it gives an opportunity for the ear wax drops to penetrate into the wax deep in the ear canal. And I asked them to um, 
keep in that position for five minutes. After five minutes, I ask them to drain the ear. That is so important. And when I say drain, I don't mean with water. Again, you want to avoid water in the ear. I simply ask the patient to tilt the head the opposite direction. So the ear is now facing the floor. And you can always ask them to put some tissue underneath. And what that is doing, you're, for five minutes, you're softening the ear, actually you're soaking the ear, you're softening it. And then for five minutes, you're allowing the drops to drain. And you're hoping as the drops drain out the ear, it can take some of the wax out of the ear. If not, at least the wax is traveling away from the eardrum and it's coming naturally. Uh, when using ear wax drops, you, you need to ensure they are used at room temperature. Uh, a lot of patients, um, they put their ear wax drops like they do with other medication in the fridge. And then when they use the drops in the ear, it, um, they get they suffer from vertigo due to the caloric effect. Um, and this is this my own preference. Um, um, I generally don't um, require my patients to use earwax drops prior to attending. Um, if I need to use drops during the procedure, I sometimes do. However, uh, just anecdotally, I generally recommend ear rolls. So ear roll, I don't know if it's available um, Sure, it is actually globally, but it's a type of um, olive oil. It's a, a highly refined um, oil, um, which makes it thinner, uh, which allows it to drain better out of the ear. Some of the other types of oil, olive oil drops, it's a lot more viscous and thick. And it doesn't drain out of the ear as well. And um, ear roll also comes with a spray applicator, so it's so much easier to use. And I find olive-based drops, um, oil-based drops, are far better for earwax. If a patient of mine has a lot of dead skin, dead skin plugs, um, or they suffer from keratosis obturans, I generally recommend sodium bicarbonate earwax drops. I find the sodium bicarbonate has a better, uh, is better dealing with dead skin, dead keratin. It breaks it up far better than um, oil-based drops. The one drops I detest uh, is hydrogen peroxide. And in the UK, you have a company called Otex. Now, I don't know if it's just the Otex type of hydrogen peroxide drops or if it's just hydrogen peroxide drops in general, but I find that Otex hydrogen peroxide converts, changes the consistency of earwax into almost like a mashed potato consistency, which makes it very hard to, um, to, to perform microsuction on. So I've just created a table here of the benefits and limitations of different types of earwax drops. And you've got um, across, you've got the olive, olive oil based drops, sodium bicarbonate, hydrogen peroxide, distilled water. And on the left column, the vertical column, um, there's different rows there to uh, identify whether they're oil or water based, the acidity, the type of effect it has on earwax, uh, whether it's more suitable for keratin or earwax, some of the positives and some of the negatives. Um, I won't really talk through that. Um, I think uh, if I leave that with yourselves to read through. Um, so um, I will just say one thing though. I, 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 another reason why I prefer oil-based drops is because of the acidity. As I mentioned earlier, the ear canal itself is slightly acidic in pH and earwax itself is also slightly acidic in pH. The acidity in the ear um, helps um, prevent certain bacterial growth and fungal growth and also viral growth. Um, when you use drops like sodium bicarbonate, which are water-based um, and alkaline, the water itself can rinse away some of the acidity in the ear and the alkaline can obviously change the pH from an acidic pH to an alkaline pH. Um, people who suffer from otitis externa if you do a swab and measure the pH of the ear, the ear canal generally is no longer acidic. The pH of the ear canal is turned from acidic to alkaline. And that's why many drugs and medications that are used in the treatment of otitis externa are acidic in pH. Things like acetic acid, um, um, this, these drops are trying to re-acidify the ear and it hope by re-acidifying re the ear, it can help kill the bacteria and resolve the otitis externa. So that's another reason why I prefer oil type of drops because they're more acidic, um, and whereas the alkaline drops can, can lead to otitis externa and a reaction to the ear. And the water-based drops can obviously cause an infection in the ear canal. Water, as I said earlier, is really bad for the ear canal. And the water itself can also help rinse out the acidity. 
it's known that Olympic swimmers, although they wear swim clubs, after swimming, they um, they spray acetic acid into their ear, just in case the water um, that they've been swimming in has rinsed out the acidity in the ear. So they try and re-acidify re the ear. So I'll leave that table with you guys to view at your own pleasure. Um, another type of earwax treatment that can be performed by the patient themselves is what I call do-it-yourself ear syringe. I would only ever recommend this in the worst case scenario and during COVID when um, we were locked down and I don't know whether you're aware we're, we're back under lockdown in the UK but as an audiological practice we are allowed to remain open um, but that's the only real time I'd recommend to someone to try and remove earwax themselves using a DIY syringe um, almost in desperation. Um, one of the benefits is obviously they can self-administer this the patient and it is cost effective you have two types of DIY syringes. You have a bulb syringe, um, and you also have this type of ear syringe. If you're going to recommend um, a patient perform DIY earwax removal with a syringe, this is a flare, a soft tip flare. So um, the water is not squirted directly towards the eardrum. They, it, 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 the little flannel at the end that enters the ear, there's little holes that go around it, and it just evenly distributes the, the water that you're pumping in. Um, towards the ear canal wall itself, as opposed to directly to, to the eardrum to avoid um, perforation. Um, of course, um, contraindications of squirting and flushing water in your ear. You can't perform DIY ear syringe if you have a mastoid cavity, uh, perforation, or grommet, or if you've had it healed to panic perforation for uh, within 18 months. Of course, uh, otitis externa, otitis media, or uh, the patient with cleft palate who are prone to developing otitis media, you want to avoid water in the ear. If a patient attends with foreign bodies, so marbles, or hearing aid domes, or cotton buds, uh, or hearing aid batteries, or um, hearing aid filters, all these things that we find in people's ears, you don't want to be using water to push them out. And Ear syringing by the patient themselves is a completely blind procedure. They, they're not sure what's going on in their ear, um, they don't know the angle, the orientation to hold the ear syringe, so um, it's a completely blind procedure. Um, the risks uh, associated with DIY ear syringe, it can, if it's not performed properly, it can further impact the effects. So remember, when you're performing ear syringing, the theory is um, your uh, Flushing water into the ear canal, um, you want the water to travel along the ear canal walls, literally bounce off the eardrum, and as it bounces off the eardrum, it comes back out of the ear, and as the water comes back out, it takes with it, flushes out with the earwax. However, if you've directed the, the bulb syringe or the, the flare type syringe directly towards the centre of the wax, you always run the risk of further impacting the earwax deep into the ear and against the tympanic membrane. Um, Obviously, uh, probably the most um, prevalent risk is um, developing an ear infection after performing syringes with the water, the bacterial flora that's in the water can lead to otitis externa. Uh, if you apply too much pressure, you can perforate the eardrum. Um, common um, side effect of um, DIY ear syringing is tinnitus, and again, people can experience vertigo if the temperature of the water. Obviously, when we perform calorics, um, water slightly cool, you inhibit the vestibular um, organ, and if the water is slightly warm, you excite it. And similarly, if the temperature is not correct of the water, that can lead to the caloric effect. That's short term. Um, in the UK, um, Still, we, there is still a lot of professional irrigation. So professional irrigation differs to the old fashioned metal syringe. So um, in the UK, the metal, I don't, I don't know how it is other parts of the world. I know in America that in some states they still perform metal syringing to syringe the wax. That, that's banned in the UK because of the pressure it causes. The only place you'll find a metal syringe in the UK is in a museum. You wouldn't find it um, in doctor's clinics or audiological clinics or EMT surgeries. Um, so in the UK, we use irrigation. So it's similar to um, what we used, uh, the dentists used to flush out, to flush water into your mouth. In fact, that's how, where the idea stemmed from. Um, 
So the idea, um, I think it was a British nurse actually, um, said, well, why don't we use this irrigation system used by dentists to flush out earwax? And that's where it all stem from. Uh, the benefits of uh, irrigation compared to the old fashioned metal sewage is that you can control the pressure rate. Um, so you, you can regulate how much pressure you exert into the ear. Um, again, uh, it can be effective if it's performed uh, uh, well by the nurse. Um, in terms of cost effectiveness, in the, this is in the UK. So doctor surgery, so GPs, our, our primary care service in the UK still offer free of charge um, irrigation. So for the patient, it's very cost effective because it's a free service. However, that is changing in the UK, not least due to COVID. Um, a lot of doctors are now washing their hands with um, providing earwax removal services. So uh, there's less um, people undergoing ear irrigation in the UK. Um, obviously, it's not cost effective for the GP practice if they're offering the service as well, because the sheer numbers of people they're seeing. Um, contraindications, very similar to the DIY earwax, um, DIY ear syringe. Um, um, it's all there. Obviously, when you perform syringing of some sort, whether it's irrigation or bulb syringe or flare syringe, the earwax has to be um, softened. It's a prerequisite. You cannot realistically flush out hard, dry pieces of earwax that's adhered to the ear canal wall with skin adhesions. The earwax has to be softened, and the softening process can take 10 to 14 days. And during that time, for the patient of softening their earwax using earwax drops, it can exacerbate their symptoms. They may not be able to wear their hearing aid because of um, see all the oil in the ear. Um, some of the um, risks, um, sorry, I'll just go back quickly. So unlike DIY ear syringe, um, irrigation performed by impressional, we wouldn't call it a blind procedure, but it's a semi-blind procedure. So the nurse or the practitioner can examine the ear in between bouts of flushing water into the ear. So we call that semi-blind. Um, the risks, again, like uh, a, a DIY ear syringe, it can further impact the wax. It can also cause a temporary threshold shift or even a permanent threshold shift. Uh, the irrigation machine can be quite noisy. Um, I and uh, me and my colleague, um, uh, Clearwax, my fellow Clearwax director, we actually tra got ourselves trained in irriga irrigation because we wanted to know and experience how it was for our patients. Um, and some of the risks and benefits for ourselves and it was really noisy guys i was quite surprised and similarly if the pressure is too much on the irrigation machine it can perforate the tympanic membrane uh, again it can be to tinnitus and short-term vertigo if the, the temperature of the water is too warm or too too cool so in the UK, and I would suspect globally, um, the gold standard of earwax removal is performing earwax removal under direct supervision, uh, mechanically, so it's a, it's a, without uh, any water. And when we say under direct supervision, we're, we're, we're removing the wax in real time whilst we're seeing inside the ear canal. And there's different visualization methods available, um, head loops, a microscope, or an endoscope. So the head loops are bottom right of screen, uh, a, a microscope top right of screen, and the device in the middle is our eye clear scope. This is the end of wireless um, endoscope device that we have developed at Clearwax. Um, with head loops, I, I really, I, I initially got trained in head loops many years ago, and I, within a week or two, I decided I decided no longer to perform it. And in fact, it's what inspired me to develop the endoscopic system because the head loops I found were so limited for a number of reasons that I didn't feel safe performing earwax when using loops. And the main reason for that is, your, is you do not really and truly get binocular or stereoscopic vision. So binocular or stereoscopic vision is what gives you the depth perception. Because loops, um, the it all depends on your interpupillary distance um, between both eyes. And if your eyes are to converge too wide, both eyes cannot visualize um, deep inside the ear canal at the same time. And so one eye can see deep inside laterally into the ear canal, um, whereas the other eye, you'll probably be either outside of the ear canal or against the ear canal wall, and you don't get um, depth perception. 
Um, also, the magnification available with Linux is limited. Um, we're looking at times three or times four magnification. Conversely, an operating ENT microscope works very differently. The optics are similar to a periscope in a submarine. They artificially reduce and converge your interpupillary distance. So both eyes are looking directly and deep into the ear canal to provide you with depth perception. So even if you've got your interpupillary distance is quite wide, an operating ENT microscope can artificially converge that through the optics it uses. And of course, um, an operating ENT microscope, the magnification can go up to 25 times. Um, so it's, it's very highly magnified. And um, obviously with an endoscope, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about, the, I don't want to talk too much about the endoscope because of the conflict of interest, but um, for me and uh, some of the research that's available, that is for me the best type of uh, wax removal uh, visualization technique. Um, I've just had a request to annotate, and because I've accepted it, I can't go to the next screen, so I'm going to have to try and cancel the annotation, which, yeah, I can now go to the next screen. So when you're removing wax under direct supervision, you're using one of the below, or a combination of ENT micro-instruments to remove the wax. Um, the most common is microsuction. Um, you then got other instruments and panel dry instruments like the St. Bart's ear hook or Johnson Horn. You've got a fine end tip and forceps. So these are the different instrumentations that's available to the clinical ear care specialist in order to remove earwax under direct supervision. So we'll talk about some of these different instrumentations one by one. So Microsuction. Um, there's many different types of suction probes available, and ranging from the Zolman suction probe, Fraser, McGill, Bellucci. Forgive me, I can't pronounce that left one, so I won't attempt it. These different types of suction probes vary in length, lumen size, the lumen size, the internal diameter, and angulations. They are all should be single use. Um, we don't want to be contaminating patients by using the suction probes from one patient to the other. Um, so for earwax removal, the most commonly used suction probe is the Zoln suction probe. Um, and from the handle, it is approximately 8.5 centimetres in length. It's got a two millimetre internal diameter of lumen. Um, and five centimetres away from the handle, so 3.5 centimetres away from the distal end, there's, a, a, there's an angulation of 30 degrees. Um, some on the suction probes, I believe, can get an angulation of 10 degrees, but 30 degrees is the most common one. Uh, you can get a fenestrated option. So on some of these suction probes, there's a fenestration hole where you can um, put your finger on the hole for additional suction power. And if you want less suction power, you can release uh, your finger off the suction hole and it releases, releases some of the suction power. Um, so not only is microsuction the most common form of earwax removal, it's very good if you're removing medial earwax, so earwax that's lodged very deep in the bony part of the ear canal or in the in inferior and anterior recesses or directly on the eardrum. However, please be warned, earwax, um, microsuction can be very, very noisy. It can exceed 120 decibel sound pressure levels. Therefore, you're always at risk of temporary threshold shifts, permanent threshold shifts, um, exacerbating tinnitus if the patient already has tinnitus or causing tinnitus, it, and that could be short term and long term. Um, also, microsuction can cause um, vertigo, again, due to the caloric effect. So when you suction the ear, it reduces the ear temperature. And because you're not suction, performing microsuction, um, simultaneously in the ipsilateral ear and contralateral ear, it creates a choleric effect and uh, it can lead to vertigo. Again, it's short term. And um, going back to the noise, increase of noise, um, there's a thing called clarinetting. If someone's got dead keratin in the ear canal and you're performing microsuction, you have to be really careful because dead skin can clarinet. And what I mean by clarinet is that dead skin it violently, viciously flaps uh, at the tip of the suction probe, and which emits a very, very, very loud high frequency squeal. It's almost deafening, not only for the patient, it's deafening 
for the clinical ear care specialist so you have to be careful if you experience clarinetting and you generally get clarinetting and someone will channel such a dead skin please do stop straight away because that can cause permanent um, deafness uh, it can also affect your own hearing um, so you can also perform micro suction using a fine end so a fine end tip is actually uh, a narrow tip an extension but also a narrowing uh, of the uh, zolnar suction probe so you attach this to the end of the zolnar suction probe you can see on the diagram the fine end on the right hand side you've got a, a gripper it's just due to sheer force you poke this into the lumen of the zolnar suction probe it grips it in place um, Fine end tips are available in different lumen size based on the needle, uh, needle gauge system. Um, the higher the gauge, the lumen, um, so the smaller the gauge, the higher the lumen. Um, with a fine end tip, it reduces suction power. It's less traumatic. So if you come in contact with the bony part of the ear canal or indeed the, the eardrum. Now remember, guys, the eardrum is approximately 0.1 millimeters in thickness, so it is very fragile. So uh, it's less less traumatic if you do come in contact with the eardrum and uh, again it's less noisy so um, if you have patients who are quite sensitive and can't tolerate um, even a moderate level noise level fine ends are really useful similar to the normal zone of suction probes they're single use so the most common type of fine end gorge useful interaction removal is the gorge 18 and the lumen internal lumen is 1.27 millimeters I use it for precision work. It provides me more um, precision, uh, accuracy, finesse when I'm removing ear wraps off the canal wall or directly off the eardrum. You can also use it for narrow ear canals when you can't get access into the ear canal because uh, stenosis, exotosis, or the externa. Um, I was referring back to clarinetting earlier. Um, if there is some occluding dead skin and you want to try and remove it using micro the fine end is a lot better. It doesn't clarinet as much. So I sometimes use it for dead skin peeling of the canal wall. And again, I, I alluded to it earlier, I use it for sensitive clients. Uh, the normal zone of suction probe is just too, too noisy for the patients. However, it still has the same risks as uh, micro suction using a zone of suction probe. You run the risk of TTS, PTS, tinnitus, vertigo, and again, clarinetting, although that is reduced. Uh, St. Bart's ear hook, uh, also known as St. Bart Thalamus ear hook. I believe that's named after a hospital in the UK where it was first developed. I might be wrong, uh, I believe um, that's, that's the rumour. And um, it can be made of carbon fibre, plastic or metal. Um, the ones that I use are 14 centimeters in length, so it gives you good working length. And the hooked end, the tip, in the distal end is two millimeters. That's the L bend shape. Um, and they, they are generally single use. Some metal ones you can sterilize, but generally I just use the single use ones. Um, Ear hooks are most commonly used to extract very hard um, plugs of earwax or keratin. And typically, I use ear hooks laterally for so for wax that's lateral in the ear canal on the cartilage portion of the ear canal, um, and that's because if you make contact with the bony part of the ear canal using an ear hook, it can be very sensitive and painful for the patient. And again, uh, if you've got a fully occluding earwax uh, that extends laterally all the way medially. You have to, when you use an ear hook, you have to insert it in and behind the wax. And if it's fully occluding, you've got no option but to glide the ear hook against the canal wall. So you're at greater risk of making contact with the bony part of the ear canal. So sometimes you don't have a choice there um, in extreme cases. But generally speaking, I use the ear hook for lateral ear wax and wax that's near the entrance. So there's an opening where I can safely insert the hook in and behind the wax with dead keratin. And I use it for really hard wax where if you've got hard earwax, sometimes you can't perform micro suction. The wax is too hard, the surface is too hard, you don't get a suction grip. Um, also, the ear hook, uh, on some ear hooks, the opposite end, uh, it has a serrated tip and you can use that for dry mopping. So dry mopping is where you can attach some cotton wool to the end, the serrated end of the St. Bart's ear hook. Um, 
someone's asked me to annotate that. Um, it, let's see if I can. With me. That end there, but on, on this diagram, it's not serrated, but on my next slide, I'm using, a, I've got an image of a jobs and horn where I believe that image has got a serrated tip. Um, and dry mopping is essentially, it's, it's more commonly performed with children who can't tolerate micro such and find it too noisy. And dry mopping is where you put some cotton wool at the tip of the ear hook, at the serrated tip, and you basically go into the ear canal and swivel it, swirl it, and you're trying to mop up wet secretions and discharge your earwax. It, you can't really perform it immediately because if that comes in contact with the bony part, it can be uncomfortable and it'll of course, you want to avoid contact with the eardrum. Um, be careful um, with an ear hook uh, and the quality, the grade you buy. Don't buy one of these cheap plastic ones because they can snap. Sometimes when I'm using an ear hook, the wax is so hard and lodged. When I'm pulling the ear hook out of the ear and trying to release the earwax, it puts incredible strain on the, the, the ear hook itself. It's almost like a pole vault when the pole vaulter is going up and over um trying to jump over the uh whatever they call it um that strain on that 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 kind of pole it almost bends and it, i'm pretty sure if i use the plastic one in some of my cases it would have snapped in half inside the ear and as i said guys you need to be careful that's the sensitive bone part of the ear canal when you're using these instruments so i'm just going to deactivate annotation so i can go to the next slide okay so um, I don't know how to activate annotations. So if someone wants to send me a request again, I can then annotate whereabouts the serrated edge is on the Jobson horn. You can see it, so uh, I'll, I will try to um, explain it verbally. So a Jobson horn, uh, it has many different names, uh, a correct, an ear scoop or an ear spoon. And again, it's made out of the same material as an ear hook, uh, carbon fiber, plastic ones are available and also metal ones. The length is similar to an ear hook, 14 centimetres, um, but the tip is a hollow hooped end. So it's almost like a, a hollow spoon at the end. And that hollowed hooped end is around two to three millimetres wide. Similarly, it's single use. Um, if you look at the opposite end um, of the, the hooped end, you'll see there's like a serrated tip. Um, and that's where you can attach some cotton wool to perform dry mopping. So, that serrated edge tip wasn't um, shown on the ear hook picture, but it, it is on the Jobson horn. So when would you use a Jobson horn? So I use a Jobson horn primarily for soft, wet ear wax. You're, you're trying to scoop this uh, wax out of the ear. Similar to an ear hook, it's when the ear wax is lateral and there's an opening. You want to have an opening um, so you can safely insert the, the, the ear hook, I'm sorry, the Jobson horn behind the wax whilst avoiding contact with the bony part of the ear canal. But again, in some extreme cases, you, 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 you have no choice but to use the Jobson horn, um, even against the bony part of the ear canal, or even a hard ear wax. But these are just general trends when you would use a Jobson horn. Um, similarly to the ear, please do avoid the cheap plastic versions. Don't, don't compromise on your quality of care for um, your patients. You, you're inside the ear, the ear is very sensitive. For a matter of a few pence here and there, do get the best quality um, micro instrumentation because you don't want to be causing any injury or trauma to the patient just because you've got a cheap um, instrument that's snapped in the ear and causes lacerations and cuts. Just so I would strongly advise, recommend, just get the best quality instrumentations that you can afford. They're not that expensive anyway. So. Forceps. So there's different types of forceps. Crocod so in the UK, we call them crocodile, but if you're over in the States, across the pond, they call it alligator. Um, Hartman's forceps and Henkel. They're generally made out of stainless steel, so sur a surgical grade steel. Um, you get various jaw sizes. Um, so the jaws themselves are serrated. Um, and got that serration called uh, provides the grip. The jaw sizes range from three to seven millimeters. Um, the ones that I use are single use, but you can get reusable ones where you can sterilize it. But for me, if you've got a crocodile forceps and you've got a serrated tip and you've got some debris that, like dead skin, for example, or soft wax in between the serration, I think even if you use an autoclave machine and you rigorously clean it using uh, a wide brush, 
you run the risk of having some residual debris in between the serrated tips. So I always use a single use. They are quite expensive, and that's why people generally, some people want to use these reusable forceps. Um, because, uh, okay, so it's a one off expense, but they're quite expensive for these reusable options, but it will last a lot longer. So, when would you use forceps? You commonly use forceps for firm and hard earwax that you can grip onto. Uh, foreign body, so hearing aid domes, cotton buds, um, or whatever, whatever other weird and wonderful things you can find in the ear. I've previously um, removed a, a baby's tooth from the ear canal and a twig uh, from the branch uh, using forceps. So you'll, you'll never be, a, or even a tooth comb, so a comb, a, a spike, some of the spikes, something had that large and I use forceps. So um, it's beggar's belief what people have lodged in the ear sometimes. Um, forceps can be used for keratin, so if, you're, if you've got, um, if you're experiencing clarinetting when you're removing dead skin using microsuction, an alternative is to use forceps to peel the keratin, it's possible. And then also use it for hair plucking. Um, so if a patient's got excessive cilia um, laterally on the outer cartilaginous portion of the ear canal and it's obscuring the view, I can't see through that because there's so much wax, you have no choice but to pluck the hairs out. And it's generally well tolerated, believe it or not. Um, um, I do sometimes pluck my own eyebrows um, using tweezers. And yeah, it's a bit of a sharp pain, acute pain, but it's, it's manageable. And it's the exact same experience people uh, undergo when you use forceps to pluck hair follicles and hair cilia out of the ear canal. Um, some people can talk about trimming hairs. Um, I, I think that adds another layer of complexity, trimming hairs, because if you trim the hairs, they could, the loose hairs could fly further into the canal and mat against the wax. So hair plucking for me is um, what I would recommend. But it's very rare. I've probably only done that two or three times. Um, again, like all the instrumentations, there's a common theme here. You've probably noticed. Be careful to avoid contact with the sensitive bony inner two thirds of it. External ultrameters. It's so sensitive, guys. You, you really want to be careful. So uh, these are the treatments. Uh, sorry, this is the benefits and limitations of performing earwax removal under direct supervision using EMT micro instruments. Uh, it can be performed in literally any ear, regardless of whether the patient's got a mask or a cavity, a tympanic perforation, a grommet, cleft palate, even if it is infected or they've got a wrong body. Of course, when you're removing wax under direct supervision, it's far more um, safer. It's a dry method. So having um, water-based treatments, flushing your ear out using water, can always lead to otitis externa, swimmer's ear, which uh, can be quite serious if you've then got an elderly patient who's diabetic with a weakened immune system. Water based infection, otitis externa, can lead to necrotizing or malignant otitis externa, and that's where the temporal bone actually gets infected and it then spreads um, to the mastoid bone and it can affect the facial nerve, it can infect the meninges leading to meningitis. It can be life threatening in the worst case scenarios. And I've had a couple of patients who have been previously treated in primary care by ear irrigation who are diabetic and elderly. And unfortunately they developed uh, malignant also known as necrotizing otitis externa as a result of the water causing infections, a waterborne infection. Fortunately, uh, we managed to get the infection treated. I uh, refer to an ear, uh, an ear EMT uh, immediately. Yeah, so uh, it's a dry method. Um, you can perform uh, earwax removal under direct supervision using EMT micro instrumentations generally on the same day. There's no prerequisite to use earwax drops. Now, of course, there's some patients that the earwax is so so hardened, so impacted, so including that um, I even I have to ask them to go away and use drops for several days and to return. But generally speaking, you, 99 times out of 100, you can remove the wax on the same day. Um, now, every mode of earwax removal has risks. Uh, every every mode, um, even examining the ear has its own risks. Um, but I would say that performing microsection or dry removal of wax using the EMT instrumentation has reduced risk. So 
I would claim that the, ris the risks of micro search in and ear hooks and jobs and horns, et cetera, is exactly the same as for ear irrigation or ear syringe, but reduced risks. Some of the limitations, as I mentioned and alluded to, micro suction can be very, very noisy, um, especially if you've got dead skin that can relax. So you have to, that is a major limitation. I would say it's more noisier than the irrigation system, and it can lead to the um, caloric effect. When you perform micro suction, that is because it reduces the uh, ear temperature. So, um, just to give you uh, uh, a between a view you receive with an endoscope mode compared to a microscope. So, um, all the images of the ear canal and eardrum you see in textbooks are taken with an endoscope. You don't get those, those images a lot on microscopic image. And the reason for that is the endoscope view is, well, it's unparalleled. The field of view is so wide, you can see the entire ear canal and you can see the entire eardrum. With a microscope, uh, whether it be head loops or uh, operator microscope, the view is limited. It's a narrow field of view. And you, quite often you can also see uh, the speculum in view, which is more some of it. Um, so that's a, a good comparison there. Um, and here's a table outlining the differences, some of the benefits and limitations of the various visualization techniques. So we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, so uh, head loops, operating microscope, endoscope. So in terms of the view it provides, um, an operating ENT microscope, it's undeniable that it provides a stereoscopic or uh, a view of the ear canals. It provides good depth perception. So, um, Speaking to um, some ENT colleagues of mine, they find that using an ENT operating microscope is very useful sometimes for diagnostics. So to assess how retracted one um, someone's um, tympanic membrane is, or how recessed a cholesterol is into the middle ear, they find they they've got better depth perception uh, with an operating ENT microscope. I've put head loop stereoscopic view with a question mark because I think that's debatable um, because with your general um, head loops, as I said, your interpupillary distance is too high. Both eyes cannot look into the ear canal deep uh, at the same time uh, and you lose the stereoscopic view. Um, there is a Vorotech system in New Zealand, I believe, which uses a similar optics. So it's, it is a loops-based system. And they use similar optics to a periscope or an operating ENT microscope. So it converges your, artificially converges your interpupillary distance, converges your vision, your eyes, so both eyes can look directly deep into the ear canal. But the problem with head loops, uh, even the Borotech system, is the magnification. You just can't get the same magnification. Although it might provide you with stereoscopic visualization, it will provide you with uh, the same magnification as an operating ENT microscope. Now, one of the limitations of an endoscope is that it provides you with a monoscopic view. So you're looking at it on a 2D screen. And it was argued that because you're looking at it on a 2D screen, you do not have depth perception. However, you can still develop depth perception uh, with monocular vision. And if it wasn't possible to do that, then you wouldn't have ENT surgeries. Or you wouldn't have surgery in, in general that uses uh, endoscopic keyhole surgery. So. Endoscopic ear surgery is on an exponential rise, um, and that's despite it having a monoscopic view, and that's because you can still develop um, depth perception using an endoscope. And if you've been, I don't know if you've, any of you is watching uh, any of my procedures and videos online, you see I'm quite comfortable approaching the eardrum and removing earwax off the eardrum without any difficulty at all, because I've developed, I've learned depth perception using a monocular vision. And you, because you can see the whole ear canal, um, being able to visualize the whole ear canal, you can visualize the first bend, the second bend, the interior, uh, interior recess, the anterior recess, use shadows. And using all this other available information that's provided only by an, uh, an endoscope, you can develop that perception. So, um, the field of view. So, the field of view with both uh, head loops and microscopes are narrow, whereas with an endoscope it's wide, and that's the major benefit of an endoscope. It provides you with a panoramic view of the ear canal. And you're, it's almost like you're inside the ear canal and you're in a bubble almost. You can touch and reach out around you, and that's why an endoscope is so, so, so beneficial. In terms of depth of view, I would argue with the head loops, you, as I said, you don't get that magnification. 
and it's limited um, times three to times four magnification. So I think, and I've used them before, so I kind of pretty sure I can confidently say you don't get a good view um, needily. You can only see the depth of view is limited to the lateral outer part of the ear canal. If you've got wax against the ear drum, I think it's very difficult to remove using head loops. Whereas with both with an operating ENT microscope or um, with an endoscope, um, you can quite easily uh, visualize the eardrum and remove the needle wax. Magnification, so as I've just alluded to, magnification with head loops is limited. Uh, with an ENT operating microscope, it's very high. And the magnification with an endoscope works differently. The closer you, in some ways, you, you, you insert the endoscope to the object, to the viewing object, you get more magnification. So in terms of portability, however, an ENT microscope weighs a ton. It's got a very large blueprint. It's not portable, whereas both loops and an endoscope is extremely portable. And in terms of costs, um, an ENT operating microscope in the UK, a good quality one, can range between ten and fifteen thousand pounds. Whereas our wireless um, eye clearscope is one tenth of the cost, probably. And head loops are probably the cheapest. You can get them very cheap. Um, and there was a clinical study performed by Potier et al. Now Potier uh, sadly passed away. He's an ENT consultant. He um, used to work. Uh, south of England and before moving to Canada. So I don't know if you also heard of uh, Mr. Pottier, who's a now ENT consultant. And he's really the only one that and his two colleagues who've performed some clinical research comparing different uh, methods of ear wax removal. And um, he compared endoscopic to microscopic ear wax removal using an ENT microscope in the randomized clinical trial. And uh, the findings of that study were that endoscopic earwax removal was significantly easier, quicker, more comfortable to perform than my. I just want to show you a couple of videos. I don't know if this is going to work uh, because these are linked to my YouTube channel. So I'm just going to play some. Play this. I don't think it's going to work, um, unfortunately, using Cisco. Um, it did work over MS Teams, but. Oh, I think it's loading. So, so to the left, there's a video of me removing the anterior recess, so immediately and off the eardrum directly using endoscopic ear suction, which we coined e suction. Um, I don't know if you guys can uh, viewing that and if it's loading and you can see that. And see, and to the right, I'm just playing the video of myself removing. Uh, I think it's a hearing aid dome from the patients, and I got lodged um, into the now. Just gripping it, quite easy to remove in the end. I'll just go to the next slide if I can. Uh, Another type of treatment, so we're going kind of left wing here, and but I wanted to discuss this because there's a lot of people that still um, have thermal auricular therapy performed. So thermal auricular therapy is also known as ear candling or hoppy ear candles or ear coning. And I'll just give you some, um, um, some uh, so I just I don't know how I learned this, but I did. Um, the word hoppy, um, is actually um, derived from a North American tribe. And the manufacturers of hoppy ear candles, of, of ear candles, um, use the word hoppy uh, because they made the claim that this North American tribe, the, the hoppy tribe, used to use ear candles themselves. However, this claim was strongly defended and uh, re rebutted by the hoppy tribe, and they actually took the ear candling companies to court to say, we. We've never used ear candles. We don't want to be associated with this form of treatment. And we want to associate the word hoppy with ear candles. But I think the holes is already bolted, unfortunately. And a lot of people in the UK still call it hoppy ear candles. But in theory, it shouldn't. So what is a hoppy ear candle? It's a hollow candle made up of beeswax. And it's inserted into the ear canal. And the opposite end is lit. 
by lighting the opposite end, it supposedly creates a vacuum effect, uh, like a chimney. And hot air obviously rises, so you're lighting the tip of the, the candle, hot air from the ear canal rises uh, like a chimney, and it supposedly creates a suction effect, and it purports to extract earwax. And people who perform um, ear candling, what they do post-procedure, they unravel the candle and show all the residue that the candle has collected inside and they claim that's earwax but that's been scientifically and clinically proven not to be earwax that debris that's found within the ear candle is actually hot and well, cooled beeswax the same wax that's made the candle um, and i have had an instance before where a patient had used um, ear candling and hot beeswax fell into the hollow candle straight onto the ear and it scolded the tympanic membrane. I think there has a case as well, it wasn't my patient, whereby uh, it actually perforated the eardrum. So this should be avoided. This is not a clinical procedure. Uh, never ever recommend or perform ear candling for your patients. Um, let's see. And that, I think that's roughly 45 minutes. Um, I, yeah, I'm happy to take any May have or... uh, Hi, uh, hello, Mr. Hi, or... Yeah, Mr. Neil, hello. Hi there. Yeah, this is Sudhir uh, Bhanu. I'm uh, actually moderating your session for the benefit of our delegates. I, I was really fascinated to hear uh, you speaking. Uh, in succinct manner, you have described how various methods of uh, removing ear wax can be taken up. I have one question before I let Arthur ask you. Uh, uh, in UK, is it a common practice uh, that you can remove ear wax yourself? Yes, that's a great question. So, um, I trained as an audiologist. I qualified back in 2008. When I qualified, uh, any audiologist practiced earwax removal. Um, earwax removal in the UK was exclusively performed in primary care. When we say primary care, we mean by doctors, GPs, and nurses at uh, doctor's surgeries. Or earwax for the more complex cases, they were performed um, in secondary care by ENT consultants or ENT nurses. Audiologists were not involved in earwax removal at all. However, in the last decade, we've seen a fundamental shift. More and more doctor surgeries are reluctant to perform earwax removal um, using irrigation, partly because they don't have the resources, uh, because they're, they're so busy, they want their nurses doing other things. And actually, they don't get funded by the government to provide that service. So there's more and more people now who are unable to get their ears irrigated. And, and another reason is because doctors often get sued by their patients due to um, side effects, complications arising from ear irrigation. So doctors are like, hang on, we're, we're removing this earwax free of, free of charge at, at our own cost. And these patients are developing infections and taking us to court. So they stop. So there's a big demand in the UK over the last 10 years. And I would estimate now at least 50% of audiologists in the UK, in the private sector anyway, are now performing earwax removal. Earwax removal in the UK for audiologists has almost become the bread and butter. It's become our main revenue earner in the UK, um, especially during COVID. So uh, the answer to your question, yes, in the UK, it's, it's more rare that you find an audiologist who doesn't now perform earwax removal compared to one that does. So it's very common. Hopefully, the Indian uh, otolaryngologists will have a similar view, but it is their bread and butter now. Okay, my following corollary question is, there can be one or two instances where there will be scraping of the external ear uh, skin and there might be some amount of bleeding. So, then are you empowered to prescribe medication? No, so in the UK, we don't, we're not, as audiologists, we're not allowed to prescribe medication at the moment. However, a cut uh, in the ear canal is not going to do any harm. So if, um, yeah, and it does happen, you can get bruising, you can get blistering. And yes, um, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I have uh, complex patients. Sometimes I have slightly abrased the ear canal and a bit, ble bit of bleeding. In that instance, is actually, you don't want medication. Uh, what you want to do is stem the, 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 the bleeding. Um, and the ear is very good at clotting anyway. So, um, but 
as audiologists, we're privy to auto blocks for taking ear impressions. So if ever there's a bit of bleeding in the ear canal and I want to stem that bleeding, I insert an auto block to apply some compression. And um, obviously, uh, you always tell the patient, and this is general advice for the general population, but in a bit of bleeding, tell the patient to avoid water in the ear. As long as you apply some compression, to avoid water in the ear, you'll be fine. Um, so it's not a concern, really. It happens quite often when you remove wax. And also, when you've got dead skin, keratin, skin adhesions, when you remove skin, or sometimes you remove a plug of earwax and attach to that wax or some keratin, and that keratin comes off the canal wall, and then you get the undergrowth of skin and it can get a bit of bleeding, but it's nothing to worry about. But yeah, in summary to your question, in the UK, audiologists cannot prescribe medication as yet. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to have heard your presentation. Now I request Pragya and Shubhasmita to help other uh, delegates ask questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So there are some questions. I'll just ask, in which all physical phenomenon cerumen is getting removed? I have heard about that while taking bath, it will be removed. Is it right or wrong? So, so I think quite um, the line is a bit bad, but is that whilst bathing and showering, earwax will be removed? Is that the question? Yes. yes, yes. That's false. You, you don't want to get water in your ear. Um, so when you're bathing and showering, you want to avoid water. Earwax will naturally come out during the shedding process. So as the skin that lines the ear canal dies and sheds, the ear has uniquely evolved to allow the skin to migrate outwards naturally, like a uh, like a conveyor belt. It's that skill right that is what removes earwax from the ear water should not be put in the ear so the answer to that question is uh, no wax does not come out whilst bathing and showering because you shouldn't be getting wax um, water or uh, when you're bathing or showering in the ear in the first place okay got it so our next question is do you always do ear examination and wax removal for infants or babies before oae ABR, not on newborn babies when you schedule a test later to two to three months? Um, so in the UK, um, I don't really do much paediatric uh, audiology myself because the system here. So um, paediatric audiology is mainly within the NHS system. So I, I don't often do um, ABRs or OAEs anymore. I used to when I used to work for the NHS. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of age, um, I'll answer the question a different way. Uh, the youngest patient I've, I've ever removed earwax from is 18 months age. And um, obviously, if you're performing ABRs and OAEs, you are going to have to remove the wax because that's impeding the, uh, the, the transmission sound to the ear canal. So you have very little choice. But obviously, if you're performing microsuction, you may get a temporary threshold shift. So that may affect your OAE readings. It may affect your ABR readings. So that's something you have to bear in mind. Thank you so much. Um, did that answer the question? I'm not sure if it did or not. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Uh, I guess uh, all the questions. OK, there, there is one more question. How often anybody should visit a professional for ear wax removal? Um, the answer to that is um, when you've got symptoms. So if you don't have any symptoms, earwax is good for you. It's a healthy substance. In one of my earlier slides, I mentioned that earwax is slightly acidic. The acidity helps repel insects. It has antimicrobial effects. It inhibits certain bacterial reproduction and fungal reproduction. It's greasy, it's sticky, it's uh, fatty, and it provides a protecting film over this delicate skin layer that coats the ear canal to prevent bacteria from um, getting deep within the dermis layer of the skin. Earwax also helps trap foreign particles that enter the ear. Um, so actually, I, unless a patient suffers from chronic earwax removal, you, I wouldn't tell a member of the public to every year go get their ears checked just in case they've got earwax, because earwax is good. For um, 94 to 98% of the people in the UK at least, um, we all have earwax, but it doesn't cause us a problem. So. The only time I would advise someone to have their ears regularly examined is under the following circumstances. If someone's got a mastoid cavity, some of the mastoid cavity, they're very likely to get a buildup of earwax and dead skin, which regularly needs to be cleaned. Uh, 
if someone has a, a, a widened annulus or medial uh, portion of the ear canal because that dead skin can't migrate from there. Um, and just your own patients that you know who are chronic sufferers of earwax, they're the only people who I'd recommend to attend regularly. Otherwise, the general public only go and see your doctor or an audiologist about earwax if you've got symptoms, really. So that's true. Thank you so much, sir. I guess all the questions are answered. So if anybody has uh, any other questions, I uh, they can just question. use... Okay, okay. Yeah, please So, uh, Neil, how can we improve the status of keratin in the ear canal? Like one of the common practices that I know is of using Miracil uh, Pro Ear uh, solution, but uh, I'm not too sure about that. So let me just read. Well, that did you ask? How can we improve the the, the, the health of the skin in the ear canal? Is that yeah, the you... keratin status in the ear canal. Um. So uh, you avoid water again. Um. Mm -hmm. Um. What. What it will do in the ear canal, not only will it introduce bacteria, but it will have an osmotic effect. So water from the keratin skin cells will um, exit the, the kind of um, epithelial skin cells into the ear canal. So it will dry the ear canal more. So avoid water. Don't poke in the ear canal. Uh, when you use a cotton bud, you're grazing this epithelial skin cell layer, uh, which then prevents the skin from migrating out the ear canal. The only thing that I would recommend is to use some form of um, oil-based drops on a regular basis. So the oil will help moisturize and lubricate the skin cells that line the ear canal. Um, the oil itself, uh, because there's no water in there, you're very unlikely to develop an ear infection. And the oil is also slightly acidic. And we want that. We want acidic conditions in the ear. So in terms of general care for the keratin inside your ear, the best thing is to do nothing, just avoid your ear, stay well away. Um, it's the old saying, never put anything smaller than your elbow in your ear, just leave it well alone. But if you want to do something and you feel compelled, I would just recommend using some form of oil-based drops, so not water-based, not alkaline-based drops, just oil-based drops on a regular basis. Thank you. And I have some more information to add for what Sudhir sir asked, and that is regarding uh, uh, common early abrasing the ear canal while removing wax. So in order to arrest bleeding, I would say uh, it's best to use some sort of a nasal spray because that will on the spot arrest the bleeding for, and then if there's any debris of uh, blood that's getting mixed with uh, wax or anything else in the ear. You can just spray it out with some salt water on in another appointment. Um, that's what we have been doing it here. And then I would, wiping I the ear. Can... I would advise against that. I really would. Um, so, uh, one of my trade directors is an ENT surgeon, um, and he cuts people's ear canals every day. That's what he does. <laughs> okay. As a surgeon, that's what he does. And he, when we do our training courses, um, all of our delegates are worried about, oh, what happens if I cut the ear canal? We're not encouraging the people to cut people people to cut the ear canal. We're not encouraging that. But what we're what our uh, ENT surgeon says is that, guys, this is what I do on a day to day basis. A bit of a cut in the ear canal. It's not the end of the world. It will heal. It will clot. Just put some compression onto the um, onto the bleed. So as audiologists, we're perfectly placed. We've got auto blocks. Don't put any saline solution. Um, putting saline solution into the ear, that's, um, I mean, that salt can kind of, it's like salt into the wound, it can sting the person. And again, you're introducing water, we don't want water in the ear. So you wanna keep ENT, uh, one, the advice they give to all their patients, please keep your ear dry, Keep don't get water in your ear. So introducing some sort of water-based saline spray, it's not good. And I think you said um, nasal saline spray, but if you're putting that into the ear, you run the risk, you're using that off-label. If the patient develops some sort of side effects, you're going to be um, out of, I'm assuming they can, you may be in a bit of trouble there because you're using a product designed for the nose and your ear off label. So you're going to be careful. So if you've got a cut or any bleeding in the ear canal due to microsuction, generally it will stem itself. Uh, if not, just put an auto block in there for five minutes. That will put some compression, allow some clotting to take place. Obviously, people with warfarin, 
And um, one of the people, uh, sometimes people are worried if their patients are taking morphine to blood thinners and if you cut the ear canal, would they bleed to death? They're not, it, it will be fine. Um, bleeding the ear canal is not that bad. Put a bit of cotton wool um, or cotton um, auto block, and then the general advice going forward to the patient, avoid water. You don't want water entering that wound. And I generally don't even get the patients back because they'll be fine. There's no need for them to get them back. Unless they develop symptoms, they, they, they develop mortalgia or pressure or bleeding or more bleeding or reducing, then I would say get them back. But if they're fine, there's no need for them to examine them again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Oh, that was really a valuable information. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for your rich words. Thank you so much, Lalsa, ma'am, and uh, Sudhir, sir. It surely helped us to understand this topic better. Thank you so much, sir. Fantastic. Uh, before I go, could I ask, uh, did you actually record that presentation? Have you got a recording of it where I can get access to it later? I have it. Even I have it, I'll give it to you. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, first I'll, I'll, I'll send you a separate email, Lalsa, about that, then that'd be fantastic. Sure. No well, problem. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Um, Thank enjoy you so the rest much. of your day. Uh, I feel really honoured and welcomed and privileged. And hopefully, uh, next year you can invite me in person if we're allowed to fly, and I'll come out um, and, and do a, a talk in public. That'd be great. <laughs> It'd be a nice little holiday as well for me. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Enjoy so the rest of your conference. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.